or two weeks come in to take care of the lawn uh, for the church and all the, the things that he does uh, for the body as well. I want to recognize my brother as well. Put your hands together for Brother Larry Pitt. God bless you, amen. Brother Guy and Sister Mary Therese celebrated their 19th wedding anniversary. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord, amen. Uh, yes, and I uh, just want to uh, commend my uh, associate uh, uh, minister here, Brother Guy, for uh, his, his life, and Sister Mary Therese as well. Uh, you all know that marriage in, in this time is, is not something that is a smooth sail for, for everybody. And when God gave people 19 years that they can hold themselves together and be together as part of example in the body of Christ, we want to recognize it all and give God a praise for holding them together and Congratulations to both of you again. Happy anniversary. Amen. On the note, on your 20th brother Guy, I want to come and have something to eat. So you can't run away from that. Praise God. Also, brother Gerald Gailey and sister Edith Gailey as well. 17 years of marriage. When the anniversary, God bless you. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Yes, they've also held themselves together by the grace of God and they're living together to the honor and glory of God. We give God a praise for their lives. Amen. Uh, Brother Gail is one of our song leaders here as well. And we trust the Holy Spirit that God will just bless them and raise their children in the admonition of Christ. And then our sister Bethany 1016. Happy birthday to you, Bethany. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. It's one thing when you see the kids you dedicate grow uh, to be fine, young, beautiful, uh, young uh, girls in, in church and uh, keeping themselves pure in Christ. Always a blessing, testament of the parents and as well as the ministry. They sit on there and we want to give God praise for, for all you young people that are growing in Christ and keep your virtues up because God is watching you and he will bless you tremendously for honoring his word. Amen. Um, there's one more thing I wanted to say. I didn't write it down and it's just escaped my head. But um, I also want to say that uh, to our elders who are out there, um, listening to us. I, I miss you all. I believe the body itself misses you. We would have loved to see your faces, but you are always in our prayers. Always in our prayers. I want you all to remember that we've never forgotten you. You are in our prayers and we trust the Holy Spirit that God will strengthen you and for this thing uh, to get out of our system and we can be together as a body again with the old, the young and the strength that we can all move on together for the kingdom and for the things that God has called us for. Uh, God bless you all, and if you are out there streaming and maybe hearing from different parts of the world, uh, we're just a small little church here, by the grace of the Almighty God, just preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we trust the Holy Spirit that today's message will be a blessing to you as well, and I want to take uh, the believer's position in Christ. Uh, Sunday we, uh, sorry, Wednesday, we were talking about the uh, natural man and the spiritual man and we know that we have come out of the natural into the spiritual uh, later on I'll find probably maybe Wednesday I will deal with the two bodies that we have the natural body and the spiritual body and the influences we are coming under each one of them and the revelation of, of the Son of God and the Son of Man uh, they are not the same and we need one another that God will give us the vision and the revelation to become what the word wants us to become. And so you pray that the Lord will, will guide us as I'm preparing that uh, message for Wednesday as well. While we stand this morning, we turn our scriptures to Ephesians 1 and 3.
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we approach thy throne. You say that the place you chose for your children to worship is in Christ. That is the place you chose to put your name. You say wherever two or three are gathered in my name, the place where the true revelation of the name of Jesus Christ is given, so that is the place you want to meet your children. The prophet told us that any gathering without Jesus Christ in it is just a meaningless Lord gathering just to appeal for people. But when we meet in your name, the Lord, your presence also come with us. So this hour, Lord, we are basing our faith upon the word of God that you are with us. Lord, may you come, anoint your word, come, heal us, come, strengthen us, come, Lord, and let your word have its own way in our hearts today. Lord, restore somebody, Lord, to you. Open the eyes of understanding to somebody. Give somebody the strength, the ability, Lord, for them to recognize who they are in you and positionally, Lord. Establish them in the word. I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit will come and bless, Lord, your word. All our elders who are out there, Lord, we pray that your spirit will protect them and keep them. Father, from every harm's way, every plan of the enemy concerning them, Lord, you know the frailties, Lord, the shortcomings. May your grace rest upon them, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. If there be anyone, Lord, in the body, Father, those who are recovering, those who need more of you, attached from you, our faith reaches out with them, and we ask that your blessings be upon them. I also bring this unspoken request, Lord, of one of our daughters, Father, that the enemy is just bombarding, the enemy is just bombarding and trying to use their mind, Lord, into a battleground that is not supposed to be. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for Lord, I send for that word to the place where she is right now, Father. And we command the enemy to depart from that. Child, in the name of Jesus Christ, we break every fetus of the enemy. Father, may your name be glorified, O God. Forgive her, Father, if she has uttered anything that is not right in thy sight. We pray. But you not hold this charge against her, Father, but we come as a body. Lord, representing you upon the face of the earth, and we ask that you will break every chain and every fetter of the enemy. Bring deliverance, O oh God, to that soul, Lord Jesus Christ. Restore her mind back, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if there be anyone here who need a touch from you, reach out, Lord, and touch them this moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Please be seated. I want to just start with this uh, quote here this morning, 57-0804-E, paragraph E4. And uh, let's just enjoy the word of God for a, a few minutes. But Branham says here that the only thing that I have found in my travel. So what I'm going to say is, if the Holy Spirit is traveling through our church here, or traveling around the globe, moving from one place to the next, I found two different types of people. One of them is the fundamentalist. The other is the Pentecostal. The fundamentalist positionally knows their place in Christ by election. But they don't have too much faith. 
So you're dealing with people that have the fundamentals of the Bible, the scriptures at their fingertips, but the revelation, the faith to operate those things is the shortcoming. He called them fundamentalists. The Pentecostals, on the other hand, has a lot of faith, but don't know their position. You know, many times when we say these things, it's because we, majority of us, have spent most of, almost all our lives around the message cycle, so we don't know actually what goes on down there. But if peradventure, one of them someday have something, and they should invite you to go down there, you will see exactly what I'm talking to you about. So he complains, he goes on, it's just like a man that has a lot of money in the bank and couldn't write a check. You know there are people that have a lot of money and even to eat a good meal is a problem. Because they have been taught to save, 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 save until he doesn't know that the savings is for good, good life. You just can't be that stingy too much and have all kinds of millions of dollars in the bank account that you can't even eat a decent meal. Listen, you will die and the money will go to somebody else. Maybe it has never struck you. It will go to somebody else. Maybe a son who doesn't think like you think or a daughter who doesn't think like you think and they will make very good use of it. All right. And the other one hmm, could, could, could write a check, but he has no money in the bank. You know, <laughs> those fat people, but that know how to go, to go to a restaurant and order a meal that he knows he hasn't got money to pay. Boy, before you order, you order that phenomenon, make sure that you have money to cover it. I'm laughing because I've seen some people like that. But when, when they come to writing big things, they know how to really write big things. But when the hour comes to back it up, it's a problem. The prophet says here, if we could only get those together, which means don't run on extremes. Don't just have a fundamental faith of the Bible or just the Pentecostal faith of the Bible. But if you can put the fundamental and the Pentecostal together. I'm reminded of one scripture that says that one place uh, uh, Paul says that we are, we are saved by faith and not of works. And then brother James comes and says that you show me your works with our faith. Then brother Branham comes and put them together and say your faith is works expressed. Are you with me, Jay? Now, either Pentecostal faith with fundamental doctrine or fundamental doctrine with Pentecostal faith, it will work. Let me repeat that. What will work is to put the word and the supernatural act together. You ever see most people that operate in the realms of the supernatural? Majority of them do things totally outside the word. They don't care what the word is saying about anything. They will just want results. And then the others, they are so based upon the word until they forget that 
God, through the supernatural act, wrote the word. So, if we can put the fundamental faith and the Pentecostal faith together, it will work. So, if the church only knew its position, the greatest hindrance in the church is fear. Praise God. I want to put it back again. But listen to me. He says that the greatest hindrance in the church is fear. Fear to move on. Fear to approach the word in the way God has given you the word. Look, when the Bible speaks and says that by his stripes you are healed. That is what the word has said. But your faith must move in that word. And then take that word to say that when Jesus wrote that word, he died for me. Therefore, I believe what the word says and let your faith act upon that word. And so many a time when you are praying about any situation, church, if you are afraid that what you are praying will never work, don't pray. You can't approach a situation with fear. If you are afraid that the cancer will not go, don't pray. Because you are already defeated. When you see that cancer, that tell that mountain and say, yes, you have invaded my body or invaded the body of this sister. But I am coming to you now, not in my own power. I am coming to you now in the name of the one that conquered you. He said, if I will believe his word, you must depart. Therefore, I'm asking you to leave this body in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, the first day, maybe nothing will happen. But you have spoken the word. Give it some time. And what those demons begin to fade off. Amen. Oh man, you go through some pain and it will look as if you are dying tomorrow. Hold on to your faith. So the greatest hindrance in the church is fear. You know, Brother Branham said that one of the reasons why the series was revealed was for God to take away fear from the church. To give God's children faith and revelation. If you are afraid to go to the rapture, you will not go. But the rapture is not for fearful people. It is for people who are bold. People who know that God gave them a promise in this age and you are living in this age. It doesn't matter whether Brother Branham has come and died. He had lived his life. He has lived the word. He will resurrect. You are the one that the Bible is looking at you right now that we shall not all die. Until you go to the grave, you got to believe that when the rapture takes place, you will be changed. That's where God is bringing the church. They are afraid that it will just won't work. Well, it just won't work for you that way. It will not work that way. It must be absolutely believers, not make believers, but believers from your heart. Look at 63, 0728, paragraph 240. Look at this one here. The new birth. Is Christ. Hallelujah. Is a revelation. God has revealed to you this great mystery, and that is a new birth. Now that are you going to do when you get all that group together where the revelation is perfectly in harmony God expressing it through his word by the same actions the same thing that he did making the word manifest if the church only knew its position praise
is the name of the Lord. It said it will one day. So let me ask you, we are almost at the threshold of going home. Do we know who we are? Do we know where in history you and me are fitting? Do we know where God is placing the body right now? When are we going to know that? If the church only knew its position, it will one day, it said then the rapture will go when it knows what it is. Does it mean that we are here because we don't know who we are? I'm reminded when King Saul, who has been anointed to lead God's children by the prophet Samuel, and Saul, the Benjamite, the man who was the tallest among the Israelites, very handsome man, tall and structural and everything, because Israel wanted a king like that. They wanted a nice polished man. And Goliath raised up to destroy God's people. Listen, church. Every one of you anointed by the Holy Spirit, you got a new birth of Christ. There is a Goliath coming your way. Goliath was not an ordinary man. Goliath was a man with extra structure. He, he was higher than everybody else as, as, as Saul was higher than everybody in Israel. His fingernails were higher. His height was taller. Goliath's weight was very strong. Even the things he carried, I don't think you an ordinary man can hold his armor. When the enemy begins to attack you as a believer, let me say to you, church, what he's bringing, brother, is more heavier. It looks like it's, if you're not careful, you become a Saul. Saul thought he was a giant. He was a tall man, strong man, looked like a military man in God's army, anointed by the prophet Samuel. And when he looked at Goliath, Saul melted. He said, huh? You see this man here? Mm. When I read his history, he's not a common man. Not only him, he has four brothers like him. If I try to deal with him, there's others, other four who are coming. But that, that the man's structure alone puts such a fear in the king's soul. You can't approach the devil with your structure, your handsomeness, how much you think you know, you got to always approach the enemy with the word of God because it is not by might, it's not by power, it's by, by my spirit. Even King Saul himself, I believe in First Samuel uh, seventeen fifty six. He said, who is this, uh, uh, you know, uh, skimish boy? In other words, who is this? Like, David looked like a sissy before him. Who is this small, small little skimish boy? And when David was bringing food to the brothers, and he heard how this man was bragging, and, and, and he was intimidating the church of the living God, and King Saul had retreated to the camp. He's not even coming to the front. Everybody in Israel was afraid. And did you know that if Goliath ever conquers King Saul, the whole of Israel is going to be under the domination of the Philistines? Instead of Saul being afraid, what he should have done was to have gone to Samuel the prophet who anointed him. I would have asked for counsel and said, Prophet, the battle is not won with armory. God has to fight this battle for me because of this man that is here. 
and let the word of God lead him to go. He did not even consult the word. You know, many a time our failures is because we don't consult the word of God in everything that we do. And because of that, brother, Saul had retreated. Fear was in the camp. Nobody was going out. The military man was gone. If your leader is afraid, who are you? And when David heard, he asked, what is the commotion for? He said, hey, keep quiet. This is big men talk. This is not for small, small boys. So that man is called Goliath. You hear the name? Goliath. His, 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 his spear is like this. The head of his armor is like that. The man is seven feet tall and something like that. Look at his hand. His fingernails are very, very long. Hey, they will be quiet. And then David, something came to him because he knew who he was. He has met God. Goliath has not met God. He will depend upon his strength and his military abilities. In fact, he has fought many battles. And when David told them, I will fight this man, his brothers told him, we told you, you are a busybody. You don't keep your mouth shut. You came down here to give us food, deliver the food and go home. But something in him told him that, how can the army of the living God be defiled? And brothers and sisters, when Satan taught, he had this generation in fear. God raised a little Kentuckian and placed the Holy Ghost anointing upon him to meet the challenge of this hour. That, I'll go and fight this man. King Saul, he said, bring him. Then, when Goliath looked at him, he says, am I a dog? He was confessing who he was, you know. Am I a dog that you bring this little thing here to come and fight me? He said, come, and I'll give your flesh to the fowls of the air. David waited for him to say the things he had to say. That is what David told him. He says that you come to me in the name of the gods of the Philistines. That, this battle was the battle of the gods. It was between the gods of the earth and the living God we serve. Every battle we face is a battle that we are winning on our knees. He says, I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel, the man, the God who is mighty in power. I could maybe see David saying that he is the captain of the host. He has never lost a battle. He was the one that opened the Red Sea and he opened up the Jordan. I could see him saying, our God is not dead. Our God is alive and I'm going to take your head off. Brother Rostin's infuriated. Goliath, he said, bring on the battle. But David had gone to the brooks, knelt and prayed and took five stones. By revelation, he took five stones. That five stones signifies faith. It signifies the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And each stone was for one of Goliath's other four brothers. Praise the name of the Lord. And so he came in case they had to bring their head. He will finish them with that. You got to have a, a good, we have enough ammunition with a believer that everywhere the enemy passes, God will let you release your ammunition of power. You see, and when the time came, David just took a slingshot and King Saul tried to decorate him and, and make him one of those, you know, armor men and, and stuff like that. He said, King, I'm, I don't know battle by these military five-star general things you put it on me. Can't take this thing off? I'm very uncomfortable in wearing them. 
He said, how are you going to represent Israel? I'm going in the name of the Lord. I'm going in the name of the Lord. And then right in there, he wasn't trying to impersonate. David was not trying to impersonate anything. Look, but Abraham Makers, he said, one thing that has hurt our move or the other move is somebody trying to be something that they are not. King David was not trying to be King Saul. David was trying to be David. But he did not want to put Saul's anointing upon him. Because Saul's anointing is an anointing of fear. So if you put on, if you put on his armor, he will put on a fear upon him. If we want the double portion of Elijah's spirit upon us, it cannot come upon the fearful church. You are. He said they, they are trying to impersonate someone else. You can't do that. You are just what you are. That is all. And when you do that, God will use you in just what you are. And you are just as important as anybody else. So this afternoon here, you are as important as the pastor. You are as important as anybody else. You are as important as somebody in the Bible. You just have to know who you are. See, he says here that sometimes you have to separate from everything that is dear on earth to you to take your position that God has called you to. Sometimes you have to. This way, David had to tell King Saul in a nice manner, says, sir, I tried your armor on. It doesn't fit. First, it is oversized. Two, it is not me. It was meant for you. It's your armor. This is not. This is the, we, we cannot put a denominational garment on a bride. You cannot put yesterday's garment on today's work. I remember when Brother Vish dug that place there. He was supposed to pour the concrete on Wednesday. He says, Brother John, they are calling for rain on Wednesday. He checked the weather pattern before. Now, if you had gone on Wednesday and the rain came down, it would have destroyed everything. So, checking in advance, he realized that I cannot pour concrete in the rainy season. The weather got to be a little clear, dry, for it to go. You get what I'm trying to say? You cannot put tomorrow's work for today. It got to be tomorrow's work. And God is looking for a bride who is ready to take on a body change. Oh, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. See, they tried their best in everything they, they could do. Uh, 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 David was trying everything he could to be himself for what God has called him for. And then he took stones and I believe King Saul said he's going to fight the man with spear and he has no shield and buckler. He has nothing to protect him. No helmet on his head. Nothing. But they didn't know that when you have God, you have everything. But I said, when you have God, you have everything. God can protect you better than anybody else. And you got to prove Goliath was all covered. If Goliath was a strong man, why? He covered himself from head, covered. Breast, covered. High, covered, belly, covered. Every place of Goliath is covered. That shows he was a coward. If he was a strong man, he would come barefish. David was coming raw because he put his trust in the living God. Hallelujah. And brother, he took that slingshot. And I could see him singing that little song in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I have the victory. Oh yes, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Goliath will have to fall. When you come in the name of Jesus, 
every demon will have to fall. He has created a power around him. And brother, when he released that stone in a slingshot, God was navigating that stone. And where Goliath did not protect. You never heard that. Where Goliath did not protect. Where he thought his security, he had got his head covered. He had got his arms covered. His legs covered. His belly covered. The place his left was in between his eyes. God navigated that stone. Now when you pray, church, God is navigating your prayer to hit a certain target. If it is cancer, it is going there. Hallelujah. To destroy the power of the enemy. Whatever be the addiction, whatever be the problem, the power of the word will be directed. Before Goliath realized he was falling on his back, he didn't even know what hit him. He was the man, he had a sword in his hands, can't even use the sword. Goliath went and took the sword, chopped off his head. That sword was no more in the hands of Goliath. Let me say this to you. The sword is now in the hands of the bride. Hallelujah. Amen. And we are going after the head to chop off everything that is not of God. That, so that the word will have power. Be persistent. Hold your position in Christ. Your confession. Hold fast your confession in Christ. As a believer, you must always confess Christ as your Savior. In your belief, in your confession, take him as your Lord. Never be afraid to confess the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because at the mention of the name of Jesus Christ, every knee has to bow. Every tongue has to confess that the Lord Jesus Christ is your king, is your savior, is your victory. You know, when Jesus was telling the Pharisees, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days, they were saying to him, what did you say? This temple was built in 46 years. You're going to destroy it and in three days time you raise it up? Are you out of your mind? Yeah, they were, they were too carnal. Yeah. Now, what, what am I saying? Jesus was confessing his resurrection before he died. When he told them as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, what do you think he was doing? He was confessing his resurrection before he died. Yeah. When he told them, accept a grain of corn, Fall to the earth in a alone. He was confessing his resurrection before he got to the ground. And we had to confess our rapture before we are raptured. Every sermon we preach, we are confessing our faith before we leave this earth. Hallelujah! I said, every morning you wake up, you say, Lord, if I'm awake this morning, it means I can be translated. The prophet says here, as long as you are in Christ, you are in the Bible. You are in him, in the Bible. As long as you are in Christ, then you are in the fullness of the Bible. You are in your full position when you are in Christ. Hallelujah! When we are in Christ, we are in our full position. And as long as you are in the line of duty, keeping God's word, doing just what he told you to do, marching by the orders of God, you have got the right to tell the enemy, get out. You know why Israel could not take the promised land? Because of fear. Not for Moses. Moses knew that God did all the supernatural act to bring them out and take them to their own inheritance. 
their position was their inheritance. When the mothers birthed their fathers, they prophesied of their position. When God chose you before the foundation of the world, he placed you in the land book of life. God has already positioned you in a promise. But now is the time for them to go and possess it. And love to tell you this. Those great men that went in down there, these were the people that the tribes were depending upon their ability, their discernment, and they chose the best men that they thought had a revelation. I believe when they were leaving, everybody was saying that, oh my, look at how these 12 spies, how these men, how great they look. Oh, the tribe of Benjamin, the tribe of Ephraim, the tribe of Manasseh, the tribe of Issachar, Zebulon, they were all saying, that, oh my, look at a brother with, oh Lord, help him. And then there was a Joshua, and there was a Caleb. And when the 12 brothers went to go spy, check the land, check his strength, check the ability, check what God said, check everything that it is true for them to come into the land, to bring faith back to the people. When they went, instead of looking whether the land was there and looking that the land is actually bearing good grapes, the land is producing what God said to produce. They shifted their eyes off what God told them to do and they began to look at the Anax. You know what they began to say to themselves? We look like grasshoppers. God's children look like grasshoppers? You mean telling me that we are in the faith to go home and we have a grasshopper faith now? Brothers and sisters, their faith as the army of God have not been diminished to grasp up a faith. Because somebody did not believe the word of God as God said it. Somebody was now going to give them a vision of his own. The next one came. He said, we just, we just look like, a, you know, we, we, we can't take the land. The land devours its own inhabitants. The scriptures say they brought an evil report of the land. They put fear in the church. And once that fear has come against the people, there's nothing more they could do. And when they came and the ten men were speaking, for some reason it looked as if Joshua and Caleb on the other side were saying, that, oh my goodness, man, the promise God gave Abraham 400 years ago is true. Oh, Joshua, look at the land. Joshua said, Caleb, Look at the land. Look at the size. Man, look at the grapes. Look at the evidence we have. My goodness, the word of God is true. This land is flowing with milk and honey. Two of them were believers and ten of them were make-believers. And this make-believers brought a report. Moses was standing there watching them. The Bible says that they gave such a report. You know there are some people, they can give a reporter's speech. And by the time they finish with the reporter's speech, if you have any faith in you, it's finished. Man, man, one brother started, he said, hmm, I thought the land had a grave as I was sitting and I saw this anak. The other one said, hmm, did you see his fingernails? The next one said, huh, you talk about that? Brother, I felt like I was a grasshopper. By the time they realized it is no more the people of God of who they are that the armies of Pharaoh fell before them. They, were, they forgot that the greatest superpower at that time amen, had bowed them before them. They forgotten that the Red Sea parted for them. They forgotten that when they lack manna, God reigned food from heaven and gave it to them. They forgot that there was no sickness. Israel did not need a hospital bed. Because God healed all their diseases. You know when the enemy brings fear upon you, you always forget who you are. Your position as a son or daughter of God. You always forget who you are. That God brought you out for all these years. Protected you. Watched over you. Provided your needs. Taking care of you. Never forget. 
that that same God is still with you in the midst of your trials. He gave you manna. He gave you water from rock. You try and go and try and squeeze water from a stone. See how much you get. And God gave you water out of that. Are you with me, church? He was, he was able to bring the Egyptian army to the same waters you walked through and drown them and finish them. And now that the enemy is speaking like that, Israel forgot the goodness of God. They forgot the prophet Moses. Okay, when they brought a the report, they could have said, Moses, this is what we say. What do you say? Moses, inquire from God. This is what we said, but can we take the land? Moses, this is what we saw, but what is God saying? Brother, they brought fear until the Bible said, the Bible said, the whole congregation of Israel begin to cry. And you know when the sister begin to weep in a certain way, the children just follow their mother like that. And then maybe the mother and sister is saying that, hmm, oh God, when we were in Egypt, at least we had watermelon. When we were in Egypt, even though they were bad and they were cruel, at least we could eat, we could sleep. Here we are in the wilderness, we cannot build a house here. We can't do nothing here. And even the land we have to go to, the land itself, devours its own inhabitants. Oh God! Why did I become a Christian? When I was in the denomination, I had my life made. I now came back to the message and everything is different. Man, that sister was giving such a message. The whole household was under fear. And then brother Joshua and brother Caleb, they heard in the camp that the people are just crying. Everywhere they go, they're crying. And they said, what, Caleb, what is it cry for? I said, let's go check out. And Joshua came and I said, why are you crying? I said, oh, where have you been? The ten brothers, the ten elders. This is what they said. The land devours its own inhabitants. We look at grasshoppers before them. The land is filled with anax. We can't take it. We can't possess it. Joshua said, they told you that? They said, yes. The Bible said, they jump and they steal the people. And they said, no, my brothers, the land is real. For us to go there tells you the land is real. It's that our fear fell upon the people. We are more than able to possess it and to take it. Hallelujah. God did not bring us to dwell among this Carried down here in this wilderness for all these 40 years. It's about time to go on. And God did not bring a message, a prophet, to bring us out of denomination to wander around this wilderness for all these years. It's about time to take on the body change. Yeah. Hallelujah. And no devil, I said, no devil, nobody can stop this bride from making it. I got news for the devil. He cannot stop the bride because she's already called. She's already perfected. She's already made real. She's already dressed up. Hallelujah! She's marching on to victory. You know, right there, Satan recognized that his army has been defeated. And all that generation that Murmured, complained, and were not having faith to drive them into that position that God has blessed them with, all that generation was going to be wiped out. And God is going to take a new people to come into the land and positionally place them in. He made some of them cattle ranchers, he made some of them wheat growers, he made some of them you know, maize farmers, he made some of them fishermen, amen, God placed them in different areas of the land for them to cultivate the land positionally place them in the body for them to know what they are and each and every one of you, let me tell you this everyone from the preacher to the housewife, everybody got a part to play in the body of Christ, some of you, God will raise to be prayer warriors in the house of God Every morning you go on your knees, you are intercessors. Nobody tells you to pray. 
you just do it. On your knees, you go and say, Lord, I'm praying for the pastor. I'm praying for Brother Guy. I'm praying for the ministry. Oh God, give them faith. Give them revelation. More in the word to preach the gospel. I pray for the deacons and the trustees. Make them able men, men of strength. Oh God, to protect that body from anything through that we are coming in. Give our sisters the ability, oh God, to be mothers. Those who desire children, bless them. Those who desire to be married, give them good men. Oh my, you pray for the young men. Lord, those who desire to be married, grant them good sisters. You're on your knees praying. If there be anyone sick in the church, Lord, if there be a brother in the church, there's somebody you know. You take their name before God and say, Lord, I'm praying for this brother. I'm praying for that sister. Lord, pray. Pray for them. Lord, I'm praying. May you heal them. Let your virtue move on. That's what you are doing for the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Some are put in the body as help. I say, help. Help. You just do it. Help in the body. And see the power of God upon your life. Amen. Something is just going on. You see it, you fix it. You see it, you go at it. It's the body of Christ moving in the power of the word. Don't you see the Holy Spirit positionally putting you in the body for God's own glorification? Hallelujah. 63-07-28 paragraph 181. Thank you, Lord. Starting from, if you are the bride, the bride is a part of the husband. Even that now is a revelation we have to preach now. Before, it was very easy. But now, we have to preach it over and over and over. Because this is a time when uh, many, many women don't even want to take their husband's name. It's a sad age. But the only place that you will ever recognize it is recognize what part of that husband, that word, you are. In other words, this message is a love affair. <laughs> Let me repeat that. It's a love affair. And when we say that you are in love with the word, we mean that you are part of the word to be in love with the word. It is very important to understand the meaning of loving. When the word is imparted in you, it does something in your life. It stimulates you. It brings such a joy around you. Oh my. <laughs> you are or you can't recognize being the bride. How many see that? You have to recognize your position. You can't recognize somebody else's. What if Moses would have come with Noah's message? You know what Moses would have done? He would have been building an ark. And then what waters would take it? It would be the right word in wrong season. It won't work. And Noah was a part of it, but it wouldn't have worked. What if Jesus would have come with Moses' message? It wouldn't have worked. Moses brought them into sacrifices of animals and everything, but when Jesus came, what animal did he sacrifice? Have you ever considered that when Jesus came, he never slaughtered one sheep or chicken? So all these preachers who are telling you that bring me goat and bring me sheep, and bring me chicken. I want a white cockerel. That man is hungry for that chicken. He want to eat it. Amen, church? 
You have to believe that the word of God is powerful. The word of God is your strength. The word of God is what brings deliverance. See, it was a different age. It was a different prophecy. A different part of the word had to be fulfilled there. They were in another day of the week. Oh, look at what he said. Tuesday's work cannot be done on Wednesday. And Wednesday has to... <laughs> Wednesday work has to be done on Wednesday and Saturday has to be done on Saturday. They had to recognize if you have known Moses, you would have known me for he was the one that spoke of me. Amen. See, so the Holy Spirit will always recognize the word in the believer's life. How many love him? In 63, 0728, paragraph 181 and 182, get into the last part. He said here, what is carefully? Heavenly places, that's the scripture we read. How I wish, instead of hard time, here I've got a mark in my Bible. Heavenly places. What is heavenly places? We are seated in heavenly places. And I know that people will be thinking, oh, Brother John, uh, may God bring angels and take us to heaven and go sit down there that we are in heavenly places. But he said you are in heavenly places. Now, get the prophet's interpretation. Heavenly places is the believer's position in Christ. See, where the believer stands in Christ is heavenly places. So when you know who you are, where you are standing, that is the word of heaven to you. And so when you are obeying the word of heaven on earth, you are in heaven. I'm telling you, church, and when the believer knows where he stands with the word of God, oh my. Brothers and sisters, the whole of heaven is behind you. You might not know this. When you sleep, God watches over your sleep. When you wake up, God is sending ministering spirits to follow you. When you're going to work, angels are guarding you. Your children, when they're going to school, pray for them. If there ever was a time where we got to take every word, even in praying for food. You know, many a time when we smell the food, we taste it before we pray. But if we can offer prayer fair before we taste it. Because these days, sometimes you don't know what you are eating. They tell you you are eating fish. But actually that fish might be plastic. They tell you you are eating rice. But actually it might be plastic. You watch and see people are telling you that. They, they, they're hybridizing everything. You don't even know what you are eating. If it's some medicine before you take it, say, Lord, if this medicine will react to my body, create something, Lord, that will reverse it. The side effect of medicines that sometimes we take, it will cure you from one thing but give you ten different things. You take one to stop headache and after your heart is going, ooh, 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 ooh. Praise God. Take a medicine for waist pain and you get in stomach ache. As I said this, everything we do as a Christian, I say pray over everything. Even sometime before you enter your car, pray over it. You buy a house to enter into it. <laughs> before you go in, I say pray over that house. You know, there was a sister one time that uh, <laughs> she was in this house. This demon comes in to the house at a particular time around 2 something, 3 a.m. And then she sees this demon in the mirror. And the demon turns the head this way. Hear all about it. And then that demon, she alone sees it. And then this demon that is out there jumped for some reason 
and start ripping her. She began to scream and scream and it had been going on and on and on. One day, in that frailty of her night, she just said, you such a coward. Let me see your face. And the demon was bold enough. Turn around. It was a male. And that spirit is just coming. I'm telling this age is full of demons everywhere. There are said demons everywhere. So they call for help. I went to the house. I sat down when she narrated the whole story. Right in Canada here, you know, you think demons are only in Africa. They are right here, you know. But I'm telling you because <laughs> I know Africa pray longer, they pray a lot. And if they pray longer, they pray a lot, then the demons are there. What about a country that doesn't pray? When the universities are teaching witchcraft. Huh? You know how many spirits and how many demons have been released here? intellectual demon that will take faith out of a believer's life. You leave church as a Christian, you go back there and you backslide. Because you don't fit the lifestyle of the people. You got to be hot like them. Huh? When I heard the story and I heard everything, I see that this sister need help. And that demon will make sure because of that anointing upon it, she can't even get a husband. Because this spirit is just coming down there. So I just told her what she needed to do. She will believe the word. He said, brother, right now, I believe the word. I believe everything. I so upon your faith that we got to cast this demon out. That's all. Simple prayer. Committed the whole house. Dedicated the house. Pray for the house. When I was leaving, I just saw some small pot out there. I just don't even know what I said. Take this thing out. Take this thing that looks like some idol over here. Just take it out and dump it somewhere. And that was the end. That spirit never came back. Amen. She's free now. She's married. And she's moved on to be with her husband somewhere. But I said this to tell you that demons are real. Demons are real. The Holy Ghost is real. The power of the word is real. And demons call for help. And sometimes they are enticing spirits. Yeah. Amen. They are, they are enticing you. Oh, you see this house you left. The house is so garnished. Let me go back and visit it. And see how the person is doing. She's going to church. But is the word in there? Is the Holy Ghost in there? And brothers and sisters, somebody living for Christ. All of a sudden you realize that they've gone back to old habits. And because they never garnished that home with the word, with the Holy Spirit. And that power, that demon, they are always going around and church. Everybody else, once in a while, take inventory in your own life and check out. Am I a better Christian now than five years ago? Or I'm getting worse. If you don't find yourself in victory, overcoming, tell that enemy. Enough is enough. You have your day. But now the word of God is taking over. I refuse the devil to take brothers and sisters to take me for granted. I want him to understand that the power of the word is here. See, so the believers heavenly places is the believers position in Christ. Oh my, how that must be beautiful thing for the father to look down upon his child Coming home to him and holding his position in Christ, his faith and his confession. I am saved by the grace of God and stand there in the hour of death yet we can hold our profession. We are saved. Brothers and sisters, just understand this. That grace that brought you, that grace will hold you. That grace will deliver you. That grace will protect you. That grace will bring deliverance. That grace will hold you in his arms. And that devil doesn't understand what grace is. Grace means unmerited favor. You go to God and say, Lord, who am I? This clay here would have been destroyed by the enemy. But by your grace, you chose me in this age. 
by your grace I'm standing. By your grace I'm protected. By your grace I'm your seed. May your grace lead me. May your grace direct me. May your grace protect me. May your grace, hallelujah, sing over my joy. May your grace do everything I need. Lord, I'm saved by grace. You know there's deliverance in grace? Because if you say you are saved by grace, it means that grace has power. It has power to deliver you from the disgrace the devil want to put you in. That's what grace did for you. My. I'll take this last scripture here in uh, Possessing the Gate of Your Enemy, 59 1121. Paragraph E37. And everybody, watch this quote. After that, we're going to be praying. Thank you, Father. You feel that sweetness of the Spirit just moving over the audience. I pray this afternoon that the sweetness of the Holy Spirit is moving from chair to chair. I pray that you can feel that sweet anointing of the Holy Spirit moving over you. Praise God. All right? Now, honestly before God, he said, how many can really feel that the Holy Spirit is close? Setting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Move, sweet Spirit of God. Call from death unto life. Speak to the seed of Abraham. Give them faith. Let them know that they can possess the gate of every enemy. Because every enemy has been put under the feet of Christ. Even death. And we stand in him a conqueror. Every enemy is under your feet as long as you are in Christ. Because everything is under his feet. Oh, glory be to God. I said everything. I'm not leaving no spirit behind. No devil behind. I don't know what your trouble is. I don't know what the devil is trying to do to you. But what I know is this. That he has been defeated. How do you get into him? By one spirit. We are all baptized into one body but made partakers of the same blessing, the same power. The same faith dwells within our heart that dwelt in Abraham. That same faith that was in Abraham. Holding the promise of God just before the destruction of the world. Sodom's world in lost day. That same faith can draw that same angel to this building and do the things that he did. You believe it? Let's stand. I know it's difficult in this atmosphere to actually blurt out words because of the conditions, but be like what Jesus said. You enter into your closet, shut it off. It's out of your heart, he said, pray. You have been given the power. Your position in Christ today, every devil is under your feet. You are victorious. The Holy Ghost has made you powerful. I want you to leave this room today with every sickness under your feet. Oh, hallelujah. If there's anything that you are going through, a struggle, a habit, I want you, as we enter into prayer, I say, Lord, I'm taking my grounds today. Satan, I possess your gate. I'm claiming my victory in the name of Jesus Christ. 
you spirit of alcoholism spirit of drugs demons of dementia Alzheimer's all kinds of disabilities stomach ulcers hypertension cholesterol waist pains Lord you are still in your word I take my position as your son and I claim victory today whilst our heads are bowed thank you Jesus he's still powerful his word is still alive Jesus has never lost a battle all churches what is real father in the name of Jesus Christ as you all lift your faith with me in prayer Lord your sons and your daughters will come before thy throne Lord you may take our position in you in heavenly places in Christ Jesus today Lord we possess every gate of the enemy Lord, whatever the devil think he has plagued us with we speak Lord to hypertension and ulcers and diseases of the body cancers Lord heal the body in the name of Jesus and bring deliverance Lord all these memory loss and all these spirits plaguing your sons and daughters out there we claim victory for them in the name of Jesus Christ. There's somebody out there who need a healing touch from you. Lord, bring deliverance to them. Bring deliverance, Lord. In the name of Jesus, our sons and our daughters, every influence of the enemy that Satan is trying to break upon them, we break hold the chains of the enemy. And Lord, let your virtue, the power. Lord, will you not a God? who walked and a woman cried have mercy upon me were you not a God that opened the eye of the blind didn't you cleanse ten lepers father were you not a God that made a dumb speak and a deaf to hear you did all that we come today because we believe Lord every believer here today those on the air those in the sanctuary we unite our faith and we come before thee Lord and we are asking Lord for your grace upon our lives oh Father you bring deliverance oh God and set your people free from every power of the enemy oh Lord we give you grace Sweet Holy Spirit. Sweet Holy Spirit. Sweet Heaven.
Don't you feel refreshed? Don't you feel his presence in your life now? Oh my. I feel like David telling me, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord because I know that God has done something for somebody. Glory be to God. The Lord bless you all, church. Take the name of Jesus with you. God's willing on Wednesday night. We shall meet our stream. May the Holy Spirit protect all of us and give you the victory in Jesus' name. Thank you all, church, and God bless you. Amen.